Yeah, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for tuning in uh, for our second webinar and what I hope will be a pretty long series of uh, great conversations. Um, we had a wonderful kickoff with Dave at um, the end of last year, um, but we had a lot of unanswered questions at that stage. Um, he was nice enough to follow up and give us some of those answers, but uh, there was still a lot of questions open, and so we started bringing him back in for the second edition of this webinar. Um, obviously, this is also aligned to his uh, uh, second book. Um, you know, last time we spoke about Software Wasteland, now we're trying to get out of data darkness um, with the data-centric revolution. Um, Dave McComb, thank you very much for joining. Um, I'm very uh, great pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think we, you know, in the interest of time, I think we want to go straight to the point. And I think that the single biggest problem that um, you know we're all being confronted with, you know, uh, being advocates of data centricity, is that companies uh, tend to say there is no way to create a single model uh, for the entire organization. And uh, obviously, you beg to differ. So maybe this is a good time for you to, you know, get started and tell us a little bit, you know, why, you know, you do uh, think it is doable, and then where you've seen seen it done possibly. Yeah, and and by the way, we like to throw in a few extra adjectives to that, but it's a single, simple, extensible, and federatable model. So, but. <clears throat> Really, the the, uh, the the single simple is probably the most uh, important part of it, and um, it's our it's our contention, and we have proved it dozens of times now, that even a complex organization has a pretty simple model at its core, and that that most of the information that they use to run their business can be uh, aligned to that to that simple core. So that's the the basic premise. You start with that. <clears throat> And we get one of two reactions. Uh, the main one is no, <laughs> just no. There is no single simple model. And uh, if you drew, if you did one, it would be too abstract. You know, of course I can make a model that says there's companies and entities and orders. Okay, there you go. But no, you know, <clears throat> um, so that's the first objection is it? it just can't be done that, that uh, and there's many, there are many companies. In fact, when we were talking offline a while ago, you you said you had a, a knew of a client who, who we won't name because it's too embarrassing. But they embark on one of these projects with dozens of people for years to try and build a single model, and they finally gave up, got too complex. Um, and you asked me at that time why, you know. Why does it get too complex? Why do people try to do this? And and what I what I thought about off offline after we were talking is I think what sometimes is required is is what one of my chief scientists used to call brain stapling. It's kind of like stomach stapling. You know, if you want somebody to eat less, you staple their stomach so they can't eat as much. Sometimes people just think too much. They they want to take everything they know and put it in the model. <clears throat> and if you get a whole bunch of smart people putting everything they know into a model, you get a very complex model that not no one person can understand. So if you take a little bit of <clears throat> brain stapling and say, what do I have to do to boil this down, simplify this? What's the essence? What's essential? Um, that 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 you can get there. We've gotten there in in finance and healthcare, and manufacturing, internet of things. You know, just recently, <clears throat> we were working with this very large company who, um, who somehow, at, at first when I got introduced to this, I thought, my God, I'm, I must, there must be something really complex here that I'm not following, but they were gonna get involved in a billion dollar consortium to solve the heat exchanger problem. And if you're in a if you're in a major process manufacturing operation, heat exchangers, you know, you have them all over the place. Every, every time you're heating up nylon or, or crude oil or whatever, you have to heat it up, cool it down. And then when those things go down, the line goes down, everybody's upset, and they're complicated, and no two are alike, they're all bespoke. 
um, <clears throat> somehow they were going to launch this initiative with with you know a big technology company and uh, somebody who manufactures these things and internet if they all it i'm just going wow is it really that complicated i mean we literally just last week finished this little skunk works and in a few weeks figured out no actually heat exchangers fundamental the single simple extensible federatable model is there's just a handful of uh, you know they are pieces of equipment that have tubes and shields and and uh, actuators and sensors and you know have there's dozens of things and they have complex relationships but there isn't hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands or millions of things and and the, the variations can just be added on the edges I mean that's that's it that's what a simple model is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we talked about this, we also talked about GIST because I think, um, you know, about building this kind of kinds of models, I think that's a cool thing about this. You've done it for a couple of companies before and you boiled it all down to something that's actually transferable. And I think as much as I understand, GIST is actually also open, so mm -hmm. accessible to, to others. So nobody will have to start from scratch, but it's actually a consolidation of best practices around building such a model, right? So maybe you can say a few words about it so people don't start from scratch. I think it's a good idea and a good message, you know, yeah, to have, yeah. right? Yeah, and I'll tell a little bit of the story of with Marcel, one of your guys. Mm -hmm. so it's a, I think it I think it kind of captures the essence of it. I was I was even as pleasantly surprised as he was when we did this. But uh, we've been working on enterprise ontologies now for 20 years, and about 12 years ago we started coalescing what we're learning, saying, you know, there's a lot of similarity from industry to industry, company to company. Let's start boiling that down as a starting point. We called it GIST. Um, it's been publicly available. It's, it's, a, it's on our website, semanticarts.com slash GIST, or, you know, you'll see it right there. Um, and you, it's under the Creative Commons license. So we just add, that's the attribution license, which says you know, attribute it to us, that's our branding. And what that really means is just leave all the concepts in our namespace. So gist person is really ontologies.semanticarts.com slash gist slash person. That's all you have to do. So um, one interesting kind of case study, and then I'll do the Marcel story. <laughs> Um, six or seven years ago, we did a project in the materials management space. We used GIST and, you know, you've got to interview people and find out what are all the concepts in, in materials management, <clears throat> um, and build an ontology. And when we were done, I, you know, you run the reason you look at the top level and about half of the top level classes are GIST and the next half were started with the clients namespace because we made them up in the act of doing the project. I didn't think too much of that. And about four years after that, we had another project um, in electrical manufacturing, but product related anyway. So not th th this other one, mostly uh, uh, chemicals and, and, and consumer products, but <clears throat> so electrical products. But in the intervening four years or so, we'd been evolving GIST from all the projects and our methodology for using GIST such that we do this project, run the reasoner, I'm looking at the ontology again, but all I see is GIST. And my first reaction is, oh, I forgot to import the client ontology. But no, I start opening up and looking at the subclasses. Oh, it's all there. Every everything we discovered in doing the project had a, what we call a covering concept um, in, in GIST. <clears throat> and after a while, you get so confident that, that you're gonna find a covering concept that you quit just making stuff up. Because that's what we, you know, normally when you design a system and you talk to subject matter experts and they tell you something, you write it down, you go create a table for that or a class. So it's a little bit of, of, of some confidence that you don't have to do that. And what, what happened with Marcel, one of, one of uh, Chris's colleagues, 
we were doing a, a very small project, but uh, we, and this was for uh, polling place data. So, so, you know, we had an election here. <laughs> and there was, there was a little bit of uh, angst around whether, well, you know, was, was the vote rigged or were people disenfranchised, all that kind of stuff. So somebody put together a bunch of data sets to try and work this out. And we said, well, let's use a Senka and we'll, we'll, we'll put it into a triple store and, and try and figure some things out. And so you just sit down with the tool and every time we look at something in this polling place database, we say, oh yeah, that's, that's this and gist, that's this and that's this. And we added one or two maybe properties, maybe we specialized a class here and there, but we're sort of doing it on the fly. Marcel's taking notes, we're putting it back in the ontology later. Um, and we were both, you know, kind of uh, giddy about, you know, how, how much of that specific domain is already covered. And not only is that a productivity aid, I mean, the real benefit is, what if you went and got some more data sets? Well, if you align them with GIST, then the two of them, you run a query and it's all there. You don't have to, you know, here's a whole, now I still have to integrate it. No, it's all, it is integrated. Yeah, I mean, that's a, the beauty. I mean, when Marcel came back to me and said, you know what, we're going to start probably majority of our projects, mm -hmm. um, you know, across the board, um, start them with GIST. Yeah. Because it really does give you a great backbone and it is, you know, this is a, I don't know, what percentage coverage, but you know, th that exercise was a two hour thing, I think, or maybe, yeah. you know, maybe even shorter, but um, he said, well, this, you know, if we had had to build the ontology from scratch, this could have taken us a week potentially, you know, mm -hmm. and basically we were just uh, being able to just touch it up a little bit here and then, you know, we immediately have some results. And I think, you know, just for the audience, uh, you know, um, I think, Oftentimes people just claim stuff in marketing, right? We want to be, do a little bit uh, better than that. So Dave and I agreed that we will um, reenact basically that session uh, with Micah and uh, and Marcel um, to do that uh, and pro broadcast it uh, and then put it in the library for everybody to see because I think it is really eye-opening. It was eye-opening for you, I, I guess. It was eye-opening for Marcel and he said, you know, uh, you know, enterprise knowledge graph, uh, our technology, you know, to extract data and that this capability really gives you uh, such a head start into building this agile model, a central model. And, it, you know, it really proved to us, you know, to us who were already professing this type of thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. That it is even more doable than ever before. And, and so I think you know, if you're interested or if you're curious, if we're just making this up, um, wait for us to uh, broad, uh, broadcast this. I think this will be out in six to eight weeks. I believe um, mm -hmm. there will be a video demo, and and this come, brings me back to the other plug that uh, I think we planned on making, and I think it's oh, it's fair to do. Uh, we'll have the um, forum in a couple of uh, I, is that a couple of weeks away or is that days away? I think it's Monday. Monday yeah. Monday. Oh, it's on Monday already. So yeah. I think. Um, I uh, tell this to the moderator, maybe he can put in a link or something. I don't know what you agreed on doing, but there will be a lot of live demos of stuff, you know, uh, from all sorts. Of, and, and what I wanted to say, this is a lot of different people, um, also our competitors, because I think the big point that we need to make in this market is that, that one guy can do it and the other guys can't do it or anything. Uh, it's actually the big thing that we have to overcome is the false notion that it is impossible to do. It is not only possible to do, it can be done by multiple different vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hate to say that, right. being a vendor myself, right? But uh, we can do it better, but uh, yeah. you know, nevertheless, it can be done by others because it, 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 there are fundamental principles that apply, that make this doable. And we need to get away from that orange rope thing, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> where everybody's, oh, that's impossible to do, and we'll never go back to revisit this question, right? Um, right. This brings me to the next part, I think, um, uh, Dave, if, uh, I, I don't want to rush that. you through this, but you know, but I it's think, you know, talking about that orange rope. Yeah, I'll tell the orange rope story now. Now that you Okay, brought... go ahead, you do it, go ahead. And I sort of hate these, these apocryphal uh, consultant stories, because it's probably not true, but 
you know, imagine that it is. And supposedly in India, the way they train elephants is when they're baby elephants, they put an orange rope around them and tie them to a peg. And the elephant, blah, 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 you know, pulls, can't, can't get free. When they grow up to be an adult, they can put the same orange rope on them, put them on a peg, and they've learned, even though this is a giant elephant, it could easily just shatter, pull the peg out, shatter the rope. They know that they can't break, because they learn, they can't break the orange rope, so that keeps them trapped. And, and, the, and the analogous way is once you know that you can't have a single simple model, you, that's the orange rope, you're trapped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and, and, and that feeds into the second takeaway, right? And because I think we need to, uh, uh, that's the say, uh, statement from your side about changing the enterprise architecture from you know, the silo to a data centric perspective. Maybe you want to allude to that because I think that's, a, that's yeah. part of that orange rope story, right? Yeah. So part of Software Wasteland was, you know, we've created hundreds or thousands of applications, each with, with its own uh, arbitrarily different data model, but also each with its own architecture and each solves certain architectural problems in application code. It solves security and constraint management, valid, you know, all that stuff is in application code. So when we go to become data centric, we have to replace some of that functionality and you end up having to replace it in an architecture <clears throat> and so we you know we put forward the idea that you really need two things to solve this problem one is the single simple extensible federatable model and the other is an architecture that you can execute with um <clears throat> and you know about well exactly three years ago no four years ago we got together in estes park the the Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado, a bunch of people who were kind of pushing the envelope on this, brainstormed a bunch, came up with just sort of a, a sketch for what needs to be in such an architecture. And then three years ago, hosted a forum, a, a conference to bring people together, some thought leaders and some vendors and whatnot. Uh, and, and next week is our third annual. It's obviously going to be virtual. Um, but, you know, it's a bunch of people coming together to say, yeah, this architecture as a thing doesn't totally exist right now. Most clients are going to be putting a few pieces together here and there. Um, you know, but, you, but we know we've got a pretty good idea what problems you have to solve. It's not, there's nothing that's not solvable. It's all engineering and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, and as Chris was suggesting, you know, we're bringing a bunch of vendors together many of whom contribute parts of that. So, um, yeah, you really, you need an architecture. The, the architecture you have is not wrong. You're not going to throw it all out. You still have to run your existing systems, but you're going to have to make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and obviously some of those are already there, you know, like the data lakes and stuff like that. And then there will be the, the uh, knowledge crop management systems, right? Because I think that's the, biggest component, I guess, that needs to be added in these organizations. Like, mm -hmm. why would you want to uh, add it if you, do, if you don't believe in the concept of, uh, you know, the ability to actually manage and, you know, create and manage a central model, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. But um, I think, you know, that's a, the stuff that we want to kind of clean up with, you know, and, and by, you know, giving the demo with, um, with Micah and, and of, of course having you here. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, one other big thing, you know, that um, kind of comes along with the idea of building an a central enterprise model, and I think that's what we talked about when we talked about that one client that spent a couple of years on building that central model. I think, um, um, you know, in the relational database technology, you know, you always want to know exactly what your model is, you know, at the end state, because you're, you have a hard time changing it. Um, mm. With the approach that we're talking about, you know, we it's really a pay, pay as you go approach. And, and I think that's something that we should talk about, right? That um, the agile way, way of building this out, there is no need uh, for, you know, yeah. nuclear super gal or something, right? Yeah, you know, Ag agile got started from the prem, you know, it was, it was funny back in the day, uh, it was literally true that introducing a change late in a project was hideously expensive. It's all kinds of studies. We, we know 
that if you introduce change once a, pro a software project is in the field in production it costs 40 times more than introducing it at requirements time <clears throat> and so the prevailing wisdom at that time was well we better get all the requirements right up front and of course that the uh, the corollary to that is we need to get our data model exactly right all up front but what the agile guys did was change the economics of change if you sit there and, and spend a lot of time with your architecture and your thinking such that it isn't 40 times more expensive to change it later then you take the burden of doing all the requirements up front and all the data modeling up front you take that away in fact that was sort of a dangerous thing people we're so obsessed with that that, that you know if, we've seen all these RFPs and RFIs with checklists with hundreds or thousands of requirements because oh my god if I don't get this in you know I'll never get it and that's what leads to these you know multi-year giant projects that go bad <clears throat> so the the alternative the the agile way and then how the agile way shows up with data centric is if you if you get the core right you can incrementally add bits around the edge and you just you know we do this all the time almost every project we do um and one of our clients you know we we told them we're going to build this core model that's going to have just a few hundred concepts and then as we go to each domain we're going to extend it a little bit but we're going to add maybe a dozen concepts and he says you better not tell them that <laughs> they will think either they'll think well the first they'll think you're an idiot well, you can't come to operational risk and tell me that you're going to consolidate all my applications with a dozen concepts. Well, the first thing is it's a dozen plus the 300 we already have, but uh, they even think that's not doable. So we kind of keep quiet about it, at least the initial project. But it's literally true. Most of these things, you you and it's an extension. That, that's why the fourth adjective in my simple single simple single extensible that's the third one extensible mm -hmm. extensible you can, you can you can add on and it doesn't it doesn't break what somebody else is doing so there's right. like, there's this agile part of the modeling and there's also the agile part of the architecture you don't have to have all the architecture to, to start with in fact most people don't most people start with a because that's way and then I'm gonna get well to I mean if you if you think about it um, you know the, the the graph approach and the modeling approach there um, is really not only agile in the way that you can just add you know cumulatively but you can also change over time right um, I think that's a big one so you don't have to get it right from the get-go anyway, because I think that's a big problem I've said in conference rooms where people have been discussing the future, basically what will we need in 12 months, what we need in 24 or 36 or whatever. And they try to get it right. And that's really the big stopper from being agile. Instead of just doing, you know, what take, you know, the 90 days or the 180 days and for seeing that, getting mm -hmm. started with that. And then if you're wrong, Okay, what's to stop us, you know, from just changing the model in semantics? Right. Um, it's not a game, it's a showstopper, right? Um, so that's pretty... Um, and there's one that's that pretty cool that comes along with that. And, and some of these things you just get for free and they're kind of fun. And, and when you see them, you go, oh, yeah, I didn't even... That didn't occur to me until I got into it for a while. In a traditional system, you have to pretty much have mastered the metadata before you go after the data, right? right. Because, because you have to write a query and you, the, the querier, have to construct these joins and, and you have to have pre-existing knowledge and it's pretty complicated and all that kind of stuff. In, an, in a knowledge graph, in, in a data-centric world, a little bit of knowledge will get you started. You can run a very simple mm -hmm. show all the people. Right. Right? They're located in something called locations. I wonder what locations are. And you can kind of just follow your nose and find what things mean, even if you didn't have pre-existing knowledge of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have to have 100% pre-existing knowledge to get anything. Yeah, and the repurposing, I think, of, of, of knowledge and data uh, is also empowered in a different way. 
mm-hmm. right? Uh, so you don't need to kind of abstract uh, the construct of your data to the level that it's, you know, lends itself to repurposing from the get-go. You can just focus on what you need uh, to do with your data now, and you'll still be very easily able to repurpose it and combine it with other data that could be very similar and, mm-hmm. and, and, and still be based on a separate ontology, basically. Uh, it can, you know, the, the models can be fused um, quickly and, and, and again, light, in a lightweight fashion, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so actually, you know, the, I find it quite curious that the people that are most afraid of, you know, applying, you know, knowledge graph technology um, are the ones that would be benefiting from this the most. Right. You know, uh, right? I mean, they're always thinking about stability and how difficult and, and you know, everything has to be and how complicated it has to be to be really pr- protected. And, uh, and so they want the same, um, but somehow, again, coming back to your orange rope, right? They mm-hmm. just can't get their mind around, you know, that there's actually a different way just by approaching the problem in a different way. You know, a lot of the problems that we have in mind could go away. Mm-hmm. And, and also, I think the, the other thing is maybe, um, you know, I think in the knowledge graph space, um, we, we need to differentiate. I know that some, some of those graph databases kind of think of themselves also, you know, as a competitor of Oracle in the transactional level. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that I think that could be an evolutionary evel- development, you know, maybe in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, I don't know, but I, don't, I think we're not, uh, you know, claiming to replace transactional systems with this. I think we're, we're aiming to solve a totally different problem. And that's why I think it's also not so confrontational, or it shouldn't be so confrontational because it's not about uh, killing off existing systems and, you know, um, thus creating a threat to consistency of the current system um, or, or processes. It's actually adding. I mean, I think, you know, adding to it and, and driving more value from combining information that hasn't been combined, that, that should be, that, that we should focus on, right? And then I think then we shouldn't be so, so afraid, actually, to touch that orange hole. Right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to ad- admit that um, part of our long range vision is to replace those transaction systems. You don't want to go in saying that because they, it, the toolkit is in place and all that kind of stuff. But um, if, if you don't have a long term plan to replace them, you're always going to be beholden to them. Mm-hmm. And if, Diseconomic, you know. Yeah, we, we know that redoing that functionality in a modern architecture would be vastly different. We have to get there gradually. Well, absolutely, and I mean, obviously, every application has to go through a life cycle, and I think that's the insight that we're seeing on this part of our clients that once they've established a certain degree of data centricity, right? You know, and, and obviously, we, as it's an agile thing, we don't pour it over the entire organization, but we start small in certain places in the But even there, you know, you all of a sudden you see, oh, why do I have 43 different systems on my way from the design process to the pro- product configurator? What do mm-hmm. I need them for? Oh, 70% of the stuff that's being done or 70% of the data that's being held is multi, you know, multi redundant. So maybe mm-hmm. 10 or 15 times, right? So mm-hmm. you're wondering, do I really need to keep all of that or could I clean up this mess you know, and reduce it to five applications? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it, that, that comes, I think it's something, I would love to tell everybody, oh, we can clean up your mess, right? But nobody wants to hear that. But if you say, I can show you how you, you know, I can make your data transparent across those silos, the insight that maybe some of those silos aren't really that necessary anymore anyway, uh, yeah. comes you know with this it's a free free thing that comes with it i think yeah um, um dave i've got a question here um from actually oh this is two questions already so let's let's come with the first one i think because uh, is there an example of a government at the municipal or state province or federal level that has leveraged data centric enterprise approach yeah um there's a couple i'm not as intimate with them, but um, we hired a guy, Peter Wynn Stanley, who had been with the Scottish government. They were very deeply into this, and he knows 
um, a lot of the people that have done this. We got a presentation from the Flemish government. I would say they are probably as far ahead as anybody I've seen in the, in the government space. They've got the whole, they've got an enterprise ontology, they've got linked data, they've got a lot of applications that are built on it. Uh, so is apparently Luxembourg. I haven't seen that, but I've heard. Chris, do you know? Well, I think, yeah, yeah I think um, what you're talking about is a be informed type of, do you remember yeah. be informed or be value or something? Uh, I think yeah. it's uh, companies yeah. coming out of Holland um, and they've been really, really aggressive on that. And, and I think the value proposition was great and it, it actually was the first software company with 100 employees um, that created enterprise software or enterprise grade software. Um, um, and the market, the, the, so the biggest, first and biggest market here was government software. So this was tax authorities uh -huh. uh, using it, um, and and I think also the the border control um, uh -huh. was using it, and then the the Ministry of Interior was using it, even you know to get re register kids for school or housing and and, and stuff like that. So. Um, I, I know that that's been going on in Holland. Um, well, and, and I haven't been too much involved. Um, but right. I, you know, I could point uh, the person who asked. I could point uh, them to contacts who've been involved in these projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. My my daughter worked for Be Informed and was in Curacao, which is in the Dutch. Oh, cool. So so they had this great market. In fact, it was it was sort of brilliant. Dutch speaking part of the Caribbean. Uh, such a small market that the, all the big software players aren't going to bother to come, you know, Curacao, mm -hmm. 200,000 people, you know, but yet they needed systems and it was, it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. oh, so, so, so that's maybe an answer, you know, that, that will count, right? Um, right. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. And I think this is a little bit more technical. Um, I think this goes after the GIST part. Upper level ontologies like GIST are great tools for, the, for federating classes. Mm -hmm. What techniques does the data centric architecture use to orchestrate entities at more granular level? Thinking about aliases, translations, and alternative spellings or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the most part, uh, you can, the, the, you know, the alias and all this kind of stuff, in fact, the answer, and after a while, you're going to get tired of this answer because it's the same answer to every question, is it's a triple. There's always another, you know, node edge node that, that will solve most problems. So, for instance, the, the, um, the entity resolution problem, um, you know, which every system has, and it, and it exists because um, everybody has these systems that assign identifiers to people and organizations and products and all kinds of stuff. And they do it on a local basis. You know, they do it for their own purpose. And then eventually when we start putting things together, we realize, oh my God, I've got a different identifier. You know, hmm. if, you, if, if we ever got government systems together, you'd realize that you have hundreds of identifiers. You know, you're not, here in the US, you have a social security number and a driver's license number and a DEA, all that stuff. <clears throat> so, um, first thing in a, in a knowledge graph is you have to have a layer in the architecture that can help you figure out, based on the clues, based on the properties that are attached to something, such as your name, your date of birth, your all those things, are you really or likely to be the same as this other individual who was identified in a different system with a different identifier? And if you are, there's a single triple called OWL same as that tells you that these two identifiers represent the same thing in the real world. If the, the issue is uh, a search related issue that says, you know, I'd like to have a German label for this, or I'd like that, I'd like the acronym expanded, or I'd like certain misspellings that people frequently type in so they can find this item, you know, if there's a product, then it's another triple. So it's an, it's an annotation. It might be the SCOS alternate label or the SCOS hidden label. But it, it, it seems like every time we have a problem, there's a triple that solves it. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's it's quite amazing. We've we've just um, just to tell a little uh, about the sensor. We've had a customer have a real big problem with their ServiceNow integrations, 
And mm -hmm. what's a big problem with ServiceNow integrations is that um, it wants to cover all of your IT assets and then large organizations have multiple IP zones. And that mm -hmm. typically means that you have duplicates of IP addresses all over the place. Yep. And that was really causing them a lot of problem. And obviously the knowledge graph allows you to contextualize identifier. Mm -hmm. So you could say, you know, this is an identifier for that, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of this zone. And this is the same identifier, you know, actually functioning for a different device in a different zone. And mm -hmm. while this problem project had been going on for years and they kind of trying to normalize or whatever they were doing, I don't know, spend 30 million or something, we were actually able to fix the integration of all that data into ServiceNow in three months because mm -hmm. the graph, and you know, it's, it, yeah, as you said, it's a triple, right? Um, yeah. It is amazing to see how the ability to resolve these things, on, even on the lowest level, is so flexible and powerful at the same time um, mm -hmm. that, yeah, that that's the type of problem that this technology was made for. Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. it's not a problem that this technology stumbles, you know, makes it stumble, right? It's actually, you know, that's where we excel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me check with the moderator if there's been other questions or comments. Other questions? Um, in the chat, right? In German. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. The chat, the the questions have been in English, and there haven't been more questions. But we do have a little more time. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about what's going on at the forum and why people want to might want to join. I mean, is there anything special yeah. that you're expecting? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. To... Yes. If you could type into the chat, it the the best you can find it from our website. But there's has its own special um, uh, website called DC. Yeah a forum.com so it's the data centric architecture forum .com, dca forum .com. um <clears throat> i got it and there's a couple of things i think are special it, the first one is we uh contracted with this guy who's been our uh graph marketing graphics uh guy for a long time to build a destination that was going to feel a little bit different than Zoom, you know, because we all have Zoom fatigue. I mean, it, it's great, but, you know, you just go from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom, and, and, and we wanted to see if we could pick up just a little bit of, of, of some of what we miss from going to a real conference. So mm -hmm. we built this, this hall, this, this site, where there's going to be a main auditorium, and that's where the main presentations, we have a whole schedule, and, but then... For instance, anytime somebody speaks, as soon as they finish, they they go off into this side room, and anybody who wants to ask them questions can follow them. You know, just like you do in a real conference while you're taking your microphone off and all the people are following you out. And right. so there's that kind of sensation. There's uh, a vendor hall, so there will be booths, and vendors are going to be there, and you can go and ask them questions and get demos. And, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so a lot of the the the, the sense of it, we're, we're trying to make not just the talk heads. We're trying to do a lot of things to get people interacting with each other, with the presenters, with the vendors, all that kind of stuff. So that's one yeah, thing. But I'm oh, sorry. I'm keep going. Oh, you had a question there. No, no, no. I was just going to say that uh, when you were talking about vendors. I think one cool thing is that you do have also a lot of um, practitioners from industry coming in, right? So this is this is not a traditional <laughs> trade show vendor uh, driven event, but it's also actually a pragmatist, um, yeah, um, event yeah. where you know practitioners talk, right? Yeah, and and you know the 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 spirit of it, at least the last two years, and I think it still is, is that these are people who are genuinely trying to co-invent the future. Mm -hmm. We want to have this shared vision. We're looking for piece parts and, and, and how do you, how do you literally put it together? What, and what's working, what isn't working? So people are going to talk about that. <clears throat> and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, you know, you can see the agenda and stuff, but it's focused around um, these, these issues that need to be solved. If you, if you're going to have a data centric architecture. So we haven't focused too much on the modeling in this one, you know, the, 
we do that in some other videos, but um, and this is really, you know, how are people solving, you know, I think one of the, one of the hardest problems is data centric. Uh, most of our clients, you know, we start by bringing some data sets together and showing them what could be done and then adding some more on. And then all of a sudden at some point they go, oh my God, there's no security on this. Anybody can follow the nose anywhere. <laughs> we need authorization, we need authentication. And, and, and for sure, you absolutely do. <clears throat> um, you don't need it day one. But you are going to need it. So you know, one of the one of the topics in this is is are things like that. You know, how do you how are you going to solve authentication? If you don't have a lot of application to, to, to do it for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and obviously vendors like us uh, have a, have an answer to these, and and obviously we'll be happy to volunteer those as part of our presentation. Um, well, um, Dave, I don't know if you're okay with this, but I'd say uh, let's uh, call it a day, a day for for now. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think you've been wonderful once again. Um, probably we'll have to ha ask you to come back sometime soon. Maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah. how the forum went and what the yeah. insights were or something. A bit of a takeaway or at least come in for a few minutes when Marcel and Maike uh, come to demonstrate, you know, how easy it is, you know, to use Drift to quickly uh, stitch together data, you know, yeah. and then, uh, and at the, the same time, you know, you're also seeing how easy it is to use it, you know, your kind of like corporate memory tool. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked talk about that. So we're very try to be very modest here, but this is great. Yeah. But hey, thanks, uh, thanks for coming around. Uh, thanks also to the audience. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for your questions. Obviously, like last time, I think we uh, Dave will be happy. You know, I'm sorry, I'm just saying yeah. this, but you yeah. know, if there are more questions, you know, we we might be uh, doing a follow up. Thanks for your time, everyone. You know, stay safe. Have a good uh, good rest of the day, and I hope to see all of you soon. Right. Great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Bye.